Chapter 46 The Blessings and the Curses This chapter is based on Joshua 8. After the execution of the sentence upon Achan, Joshua was commanded to marshal all the men of war and again advance against Ai. The power of God was with his people, and they were soon in possession of the city. Military operations were now suspended, that all Israel might engage in a solemn religious service. The people were eager to obtain a settlement in Canaan. As yet, they had not homes or lands for their families, and in order to gain these, they must drive out the Canaanites. But this important work must be deferred, for a higher duty demanded their first attention. Before taking possession of their inheritance, they must renew their covenant of loyalty to God. In the last instructions of Moses, direction had been twice given for a convocation of the tribes upon Mounts Ebal and Gerizim at Shechem for the solemn recognition of the law of God. In obedience to these injunctions, the whole people, not only men, but the women and the little ones and the strangers that were conversant among them, left their camp at Gilgal and marched through the country of their enemies to the vale of Shechem, near the center of the land. Though surrounded by the unconquered foes, they were safe under the protection of God as long as they were faithful to Him. Now, as in the days of Jacob, the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them. Genesis chapter 35, verse 5. And the Hebrews were unmolested. The place appointed for this solemn service was one already sacred from its association with the history of their fathers. It was here that Abraham raised his first altar to Jehovah in the land of Canaan. Here both Abraham and Jacob had pitched their tents. Here the latter bought the field in which the tribes were to bury the body of Joseph. Here also was the well that Jacob had dug, and the oak under which he had buried the idolatrous images of his household. The spot chosen was one of the most beautiful in all Palestine, and worthy to be the theater where this grand and impressive scene was to be enacted. The lovely valley, its green fields dotted with olive groves, watered with brooks from living fountains, and gemmed with wild flowers, spread out invitingly between the barren hills. Ebal and Gerizim, upon opposite sides of the valley, nearly approach each other their lower spurs seeming to form a natural pulpit, every word spoken on one being distinctly audible on the other, while the mountainsides, receding, afford space for a vast assemblage. According to the directions given by Moses, a monument of great stones was erected upon Mount Ebal. Upon these stones, previously prepared by a covering of plaster, the law was inscribed. Not only the ten precepts spoken from Sinai and engraved on the tables of stone, but the laws communicated to Moses and by him written in a book. Beside this monument was built an altar of unhewn stone, upon which sacrifices were offered unto the Lord. The fact that the altar was set up on Mount Ebal, the mountain upon which the curse was put, was significant, denoting that because of their transgressions of God's law, Israel had justly incurred his wrath, and that it would be at once visited, but for the atonement of Christ, represented by the altar of sacrifice. Six of the tribes, all descended from Leah and Rachel, were stationed upon Mount Gerizim, while those that descended from the handmaids, together with Reuben and Zebulun, took their position on Ebal, the priests with the ark occupying the valley between them. Silence was proclaimed by the sound of the signal trumpet, and then in the deep stillness, and in the presence of this vast assembly, Joshua, standing beside the sacred ark, read the blessings that were to follow obedience to God's law. All the tribes on Gerizim responded by an Amen. He then read the curses, and the tribes on Ebal in like manner gave their assent. Thousands upon thousands of voices uniting as the voice of one man in the solemn response. Following this came the reading of the law of God, together with the statutes and judgments that had been delivered to them by Moses. Israel had received the law directly from the mouth of God at Sinai, and its sacred precepts written by his own hand were still preserved in the ark. Now it had been again written where all could read it. 
all had the privilege of seeing for themselves the conditions of the covenant under which they were to hold possession of Canaan. All were to signify their acceptance of the terms of the covenant and give their assent to the blessings or curses for its observance or neglect. The law was not only written upon the memorial stones, but was read by Joshua himself in the hearing of all Israel. It had not been many weeks since Moses gave the whole book of Deuteronomy and discourses to the people. Yet, now Joshua read the law again. Not alone the men of Israel, but all the women and the little ones listened to the reading of the law, for it was important that they also should know and do their duty. God had commanded Israel concerning his statutes, Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And ye shall teach them your children, that your days may be multiplied, and the days of your children, in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them, as the days of heaven upon the earth. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 18 to 21. Every seventh year the whole law was to be read in the assembly of all Israel, as Moses commanded. At the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear, and that they may learn, and fear the Lord your God, and observe to do all the words of this law, and that their children, which have not known anything, may hear, and learn to fear the Lord your God, as long as ye live in the land whither ye go over Jordan to possess it. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 10 to 13. Satan is ever at work, endeavoring to pervert what God has spoken, to blind the mind and darken the understanding, and thus lead men into sin. This is why the Lord is so explicit, making his requirements so very plain that none need err. God is constantly seeking to draw men close under his protection, that Satan may not practice his cruel, deceptive power upon them. He has condescended to speak to them with his own voice, to write with his own hand the living oracles. And these blessed words, all instinct with life and luminous with truth, are committed to men as a perfect guide. Because Satan is so ready to catch away the mind and divert the affections from the Lord's promises and requirements, the greater diligence is needed to affix them in the mind and impress them upon the heart. Greater attention should be given by religious teachers to instructing the people in the facts and lessons of Bible history and the warnings and requirements of the Lord. These should be presented in simple language, adapted to the comprehension of children. It should be a part of the work both of ministers and parents to see that the young are instructed in the Scriptures. Parents can and should interest their children in the varied knowledge found in the sacred pages. But if they would interest their sons and daughters in the Word of God, they must be interested in it themselves. They must be familiar with its teachings, and as God commanded Israel, speak of it, when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 19. Those who desire their children to love and reverence God must talk of His goodness, His majesty, and His power, as revealed in His Word and in the works of creation. Every chapter and every verse of the Bible is a communication from God to men. We should bind its precepts as signs upon our hands and as frontlets between our eyes. If studied and obeyed, it would lead God's people as the Israelites were led, by the pillar of cloud by day, and by the pillar of fire by night.